So if you are here for the Future 50 Foods, Advancing Biodiversity on the menu, you are in the right spot. We have some wonderful demos and conversations planned, but to kick us off, I will welcome Chef Kyle Jacoby, who's the corporate chef with Unilever Food Solutions, who's sponsoring this session. So Chef Kyle, take it away. Thank you, good afternoon, everybody. There we go, all right, show some life, guys. Show some life. So uh, I wanted to talk real quick about uh, North Future 50. Uh, North Future 50 is an initiative that Unilever launched to promote agrobiodiversity and uh, just change in the food systems. Right, because really 75% of, of what we, uh, we consume as humans is 12 plants and five animals, um, which really there's so much more diversity out there and we're missing so much nutrition that we could be gaining from uh, you know, drought resistant plants, beans, legumes. Um, so there's just a wide variety of uh, plants and animals that we're not consuming and we just feel like that needs to change. And so what we wanna do is we wanna provide people with food choices to empower them to change the food system. So the Future 50 Foods report provides a tangible solution to help people decrease the environmental impact of the foods they're eating while increasing the nutritional value of their foods. The ambition is to help people make three shifts in the way that they eat and the foods that are grown. First, more vegetables. Two, more plant-based sources of protein in place of animal sources. And three, more variety specifically in the types of grains that we're eating. What makes it so unique is that this is really about what we can eat more of, loaded with lots of colors and flavors and foods from all over the world. So it's really to inspire people to look outside of the foods that they usually eat and into other places for different types of foods that they can add to their dishes every day. Okay, so how many people had heard of the Future 50 Foods report before that video? Okay, a couple, handful, fantastic. Yeah, it's a, it's a, just a fantastic resource. And so, you know, I'll, I'll just say a few opening remarks before I introduce our chefs here because I, um, I am a registered, registered dietitian. I served on the faculty at the CI in our Hyde Park campus for several years teaching nutrition, food safety, public health courses. Um, and now, really, my, my whole career over the last 10 or so years in, in food has been at the intersection of, of health and sustainability. And when I think about um, really the spirit of this conference and, and moving in a more plant forward direction, there's so many compelling reasons to do so, whether you look on the, the health and nutrition side or the, the climate change, climate crisis side, um, animal welfare certainly, but the, the, the biodiversity piece is, is just so moving and so um, just, just incredibly compelling and I think you know, there's there's a lot of the, the statistics, and, and as Kyle Kyle mentioned, are are so stark to think about um, how we are going to feed a growing global population and how much our industrial food system has transformed into really only focusing on on sort of mon monocultures of of just such limited crops compared to the incredible diversity of. I think the statistic is there's like 20 to 50,000 different types of edible plant species that could be consumed, and about 150 to 200 are being regularly, regularly consumed by humans. So there's that huge just opportunity there. And um, so, so from a nutrition perspective, we know that um, just diversifying what we eat is good for all the different types of nutrients, phytonutrients, and um, that are that that help our bodies. There's so much new research about the gut microbiome and and just the 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 need for a, a diverse kind of amount of bacteria that supports our our gut health and our immune health and our ability to function. Um, and so ultimately, it's the theme of of resilience, right? So we want to have crops in in the case of a, a changing climate and and, um, more destructive weather patterns that we need crops that are going to be able to sustain that. Um, and so the Future 50 Food Report, and I also love that it was in partnership with WWF, which in the last several years has transitioned to focus more on food issues um, and not just you know save the pandas and save the animals because you can't just focus on saving the animals without 
focusing on some of the primary causes of the habitat destruction, which um, global agriculture is a primary driver of that. So, um, so resilience is a key theme, and um, this session really we wanted to highlight uh, two incredible uh, dynamic chefs to uh, and hopefully inspire and empower you all to, to think about championing biodiversity and different ingredients that um, are, have high nutritional value, low environmental impact, incredible flavor, and they're accessible and affordable. So um, it is my pleasure to introduce two CIA grads um, who have had different careers on the different coasts in New York and in California. So Chef Rob Lamb is the executive chef of Lily in San Francisco and chef owner of Pearl in Oakland. Um, he has uh, been an executive chef for over 20 years across several acclaimed Bay Area restaurants. He's from Vietnam, grew up in a restaurant family, um, interestingly has a bachelor's in history from University of, of San Francisco, and then went to the CIA in, in Hyde Park, so did a, had some time there, came out to Greystone for a fellowship after uh, culinary school, and has stayed out here since. And um, he's just inspired by the culinary traditions of Asia, cooking in season, and his mother's cooking. So um, we'll hear a little bit from Chef Lamb, and then Chef Dave Bruno, if you were with him in the tasting seminar, just before this, um, you heard a little bit about his background, but just to refresh you that uh, really his experience also spans several decades, including serving as an executive chef in restaurants and uh, country clubs in upstate New York. He's been at the CIA for uh, over 20 years, currently an associate professor of culinary arts, and also spent much of that time teaching industry professionals, food enthusiasts with our continuing education department, um, and administering our pro chef certification uh, program in the US and around the world. So. Um, they're both set up for their demos. We'll have Chef Lamb go first, and hopefully we can make this interactive. So I'll be in, you know, here popping some questions to you all, and um, you know, want you all to jump in with any questions that you have. So Chef Lamb, over to you. Awesome. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good early evening. Um, so I'm Chef Rob. I have um, a Vietnamese restaurant. I'm the chef of a Vietnamese restaurant in the inner Richmond of San Francisco called Lily. Um, we pride ourselves on doing traditional food, but with modern, um, you know, not, not just flair, but, you know, the ethos that we're all trying to get to, which is sustainability. Um, so for me, the movement towards uh, plant-based cooking, you know, has been ongoing, you know, especially on the West Coast for, for a while. Um, it's really hit the East Coast predominantly at um, Madison, uh, Madison Square Park with Chef Daniel. Um, that's, that's a huge shift when you take a three-star Michelin restaurant and you shift um, completely to plant-based. And so by following his lead, uh, I think, by him doing that, I think it opens up a lot of other chefs to the possibilities of doing it. Um, but truthfully, in my, my opinion, it requires large corporations like uh, NOR and institutions like the culinary to set these standards because we're only going to follow where, as far as restaurateurs, we're only going to follow uh, practices that are, are economically feasible. And so, you know, that's, that's been the, the argument a lot with, with going organic or sustainable, is that it's not feasible economically for a restaurant. But why do we still do it, you know? Um, we do it because we're at the forefront of, of fighting for this, this, you know, this carbon footprint that we're, we're putting on this world. So in saying that, um, I, I, I took a dish that for us, uh, for the Vietnamese, is pretty much, you know, like it's singularly the, the identity of, a, of the culture, which is pho. Um, and pho traditionally is not for the poor. Um, it, it is a special treat. Um, and so taking from the plebeian um, you know, nature of that dish and trying to elevate it without adding extra costs, um, that's the goal, is that you know, we, we want to be able to allow people to see that we can make these dishes uh, without breaking you know, the bank and breaking our backs. Um, I can say that because I come from a place of privilege um, I've worked with my farmers for over 20 years. I've developed relationships with them. I've asked them to grow certain stock for me. And, you know, we try to practice what, what truly is seasonal and sustainable. And with, 
what's going on in the market right now, um, it's really, really imperative that you know, our, our menu selection and our menu costing and our ingredient selection all come from a state of sustainability. Um, it's just there's too many predicates that, that, that ruin the potential of your business. So enough on that. Um, this is vegan pho. My pho at Lily is a 72-hour process. And there's probably, um, I, I, I do it with about 150 pounds of, of veal, beef, and pork. So it's very much uh, the antithesis of this one. Um, the goal with this is to bring flavor to water. Um, and there's various ways we do that. Um, toasting spices. So we have, you know, you have your recipes, but you know, the traditional spices of pho uh, um, from the north and the south are very different. The North Hanoi is very, very poor, very humble. They aren't as influenced by the French. So their flavor profiles are very simple. Fish sauce, ginger. That's it, really, truly, truly that's it. In the south, with the, uh, you know, the influence of the French, we have the, the, the advent of beef, which is very luxurious. Um, but to that, we have black peppercorn, coriander seed, fennel seed, star anise, cinnamon. Um, I mean, it's just a whole plethora of aromatics that get toasted to start. And so for me, I want to bring up MSG and its role in, in my style of cooking. We don't, I don't use MSG. I don't, I, I, it's not that I don't believe in it, I just don't need to because I can assert enough flavor from this stock using natural ingredients. But I have secret ingredients. So like peanut worm, right? No one's really heard of it. It's, it literally is a worm that comes out of the, the sand. I didn't even hear of it until I met Lily and Lucy, the sisters that own that res the restaurant. They're like, you need to add that to your broth. And so by adding that, and then adding you know, dried, dried mushrooms, you create MSG, right? So that's, that's really the basis of, of where we're going to, is, is creating these flavor profiles without the use of additives, right? Um, but don't get me wrong, Norris is important to us. You know, as a chef, I, my sole job is to bring a return on investment, which is delicious food. And if I can have a way to, to give me a little bit of a shortcut, especially with the cost of labor these days, you just gotta balance it out. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't believe in, in making everything from scratch. There's just some things that you can't duplicate. Heinz is successful for a reason. I don't need to make ketchup. Um, so anyways, back to this. Um, so you start with to the toasting of the spices and then we just hit it with cold water. Start with the traditional French mirepoix. My, my mom hates that I do this, that I use mirepoix. Because it just, for me, it, it adds those flavors that I can get without taking that teaspoon of MSG and putting it in there. Because that's what it is, it's a shortcut. It's a shortcut based on you know, impoverished pantries. You don't have the luxury of all these other ingredients. So you gotta make it fast and flavorful. Um, so anyways, with, with the stock, I just bring it up with the mirepoix, and then most importantly is the caramelization of these aromatics. Um, ginger, onion, shallot. Some people like to do it over an open flame, some people do it over cast iron. I, 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 just, I just try to burn it. I burn it until I see the moisture coming out of it. So that means it's starting to caramelize, and it's giving that, not only the color, but that nuttiness to the stock. Um, and in this case, because it's a vegan stock, I, I go hardcore. I really like, I try to bring as much flavor to that table um, because of the fact that there's no protein in it. Chef, are you peeling the ginger when you char it? So there's two, two, two methodologies. People think that the charring of the ginger um, and leaving that skin on creates bitterness in the, the, the broth. So I like, I like to char it and I take half of it and I'll peel it, the other half I'll just let it be for the color. Um, you know, it, it's, it's weird with pho, everybody has their own, 
you know, their own taste profile with it, but it needs to be clear and it needs to be balanced in flavor. So, you know, with, with this product, I, I literally um, am just trying to get a water, a water broth flavorful. And it really isn't that hard. You know, I've got the basics right here already, okay? So this thing goes for about two hours. I, I don't really time my broth. I gauge it once the, the daikon and the carrot is soft. Um, that's when I take it off, and that's when I hit it with my other aromatics like cilantro and, and basil. And again, that's in, that's in your recipe. I just wanted to talk about the process of, of making this pro, uh, particular pho. So in finishing it, though, I, I did take a shortcut. So I use this uh, ultimate vegetable base, and it's good. It gives it balance. It gives it that necessary salt. I didn't use any soy. I didn't use any fish sauce. I just used this to season it and a little bit of kosher salt, um, and then yeah, the rock sugar. But you know, with, with this dish, I decided to showcase mushrooms, right? Um, these are coming from a guy named Joe uh, Buchanan of Black Diamond uh, Mushrooms here uh, locally in San Francisco in the Bay Area. And you know, we, we talked about you know, the Future 50 and mushrooms that you know, are, are completely sustainable, but also delicious and unique and good for you. Um, for me, you know, I, I wanted to bring some meatiness to the table. So I, I, just, I simply just sear this in olive oil and a little bit of salt. You know, if you want, you want it charred, I mean, you know, some people like their, their mushrooms really crispy and hardcore, but this was a simple saute, and then I deglazed it with this roast umami, and it's delicious. It makes it, like, meaty. So again, you know, it's, it's a shortcut that I could take, because, hell, I'm making this thing vegan, so it's all good for you. Right? And then mm -hmm. just, you know, as you build it, we're using shirataki noodles, again, in, in, um, in respect to just trying to make this, you know, vegan and, and just more health-driven, gluten-free as well. Um, these shirataki noodles, I, made, I think they're made out of sweet potato, sweet potato. So, you know, for people who are, you know, rice flour, have aversity to rice flour or wheat flour, this is a very, very good alternative. Um, so with, with this, you know, we, we're, all we're doing is, and you don't mind if I use my fingers because I use my fingers everywhere. Um, you know, these mushrooms, yeah, you just want to prepare this like any bowl of ramen. Every, any one of you guys can do this. Um, I poached some daikon in the broth, which I like because daikon tastes great and it's also very, very good for you. Bean sprouts, another one of the future 50s. Most people just think bean sprouts taste like water, and I tend to agree. But because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a you know, going to be a diabetic, I use the bean sprouts instead of the noodles. So I love them. I just take the noodles out and I do all bean sprouts. And it just makes the meal for me because it's really for us, it's about the broth. So these are cordyceps. Have you all heard of cordyceps? I mean, it's starting to get popular in, in cooking. I've seen some Italian chefs put it on their pizzas. Um, it's delicious. The texture is wonderful. It's nutty and it's just vibrant, and you can get a lot of it. So this is something that's starting to be grown more by Western farmers, but it's very, very popular uh, in Asian cookery. Chef, is that a mushroom? It is a mushroom. Um, there's, so they're cultivating it now, um, but in, in some parts of the world, it, it literally is a parasite that grows off of caterpillar. So, but it's very high in nutrients, uh, protein. I mean, it's, it's a really, really like, yeah. And with everything from Asian pantries that's good for you, it helps in virility, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, oh, on the ants too, see? All right, so yeah, guys. So one trick, you know, that we've always learned is, you know, that first pour, because the last thing you ever want is a broth that is, um, you know, cold or noodles that are cold. At my restaurant, I microwave the noodles before I put the broth on. And I'll be happy to admit that. 
because it's the only way. I'm sick of my aunts and uncles returning my, my broth because it's not hot enough. So yeah, I mean, you know, we, we have some, you know, some greens. You can blanch the greens. I like them fresh. And then some cilantro and Thai basil. Um, did you guys see that, that article that Eric Repair of Le Bernardin wrote? And he got a lot of flack for. He did. He did a Vietnamese. He did exactly what I did. But because he's not Vietnamese, he, he, got, he got jammed for it, which is ridiculous because he's a Buddhist. He has his right to make a vegan soup, noodle soup, even though the noodles, the noodles were weird. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that is the, the, the vegan pho, okay, the mushroom pho. Um, now I'm going to do a salad. It's a really, really easy salad. We at the restaurant... Um, we pride ourselves in taking traditional dishes that we grew up eating and kind of giving them a, a little bit of a twist, but still uh, it needs to reflect the, the, the flavors of Vietnam. So in, in this dish, I, I originally envisioned it as a, a chicken salad, um, just a new, new style chicken salad with a bunch of you know, different ingredients uh, rolling in there. But so in transferring it over to using you know, Future 50 ingredients, it was super easy. I mean, there's just, the, the pantry is so large for you. Um, this is almost like a, a, a mixed chopped salad, you know? So you can just get different textures and different flavor profiles together, but have, I have two different sauces that, that will form um, pretty much the bridge that puts it all together. One is a creamy sauce that's based on, on, on Noor, the, the um, vegan mayonnaise, which is freaking great, because I am so sick of dealing with vegan sandwiches and trying to do tahini and, and like all these other spreads on there, like tapenades, like all we needed was a vegan mayo, like Hellman's, and which is what they've, they've been able to pull off. So it's, it's, it's simple, it's, it's that, sriracha, and ketchup, equal parts, right? Make it easy, make it simple, but that starts, the bottom of the bowl, and then I just build little mounds. This is jicama, chopped cabbage. Try to keep the mounds like the same height, okay? This is Brokaw Farm avocado. It's one of the oldest avocado farmers in California and the best. His avocados are great because they last forever. You buy an avocado from certain markets, they'll be dead once they get soft. I'll pull out an avocado from Brokaw, and it'll be soft and mushy, and you'll open it up, and it'll be delicious and beautiful. This avocado is probably 10 days old. Sorry, excuse me. All right, so we got sprouted chickpeas. You can get, I mean, sprouted anything, so. During the summer, I use dry farm tomatoes. Um, you know, I, I take chicken. This is lychee nut. And then, oh, sorry, I need the watercress. Sorry, sweetie. <laughs> watercress, cilantro. And then, I like big flavors of mint. Some people tear it up. I'm gonna toss this all anyways. So this is unique. This is called banh chang, uh, tapioca rice flour, but really thin. This, they don't, this is the one that we use to eat in salads and in snacks. This is not the one that we use to roll up uh, into rolls. It's, it's too thick. This is thin as can be. So the Vietnamese have this saying, it's called yan. We like texture. We like, we like chewy, we like crispy, we like soft. It's, it's just, we like mouthfeel. Mochi is very, very big in the Vietnamese community. Um, so what this does is, you know, it's, it's just, we layered it all on top. 
And then that's presented to the table, but our server comes up with a little saucer of nukmam. And in this case, this nukmam is a vegan nukmam, so no fish sauce. So I use the nor citrus with water. So that, that, that's, that nor citrus is really strong. It, I almost treated it like fish sauce. So I dilute it. And a lot of water, garlic, and then this thing, which is, that's what makes it special. This is a finger lime. This is another crop that's, it's a superfood, but it's gaining a lot of popularity here in the country. It's great. It's just little caviar. I don't know if you can see it, but they're just little like pellets of citrus pop. And these are super fragrant. The first round of farmers starting this product here in the country are getting damn good at it. And so, I mean, these are, yeah, you can smell them from a mile away. Um, I just like the texture it gives and then the flavors it, it also gives. Hmm. So that just gets poured over the, uh, dressed over the rice paper. And what happens is we toss it and then it softens up. So, and that's where you get that texture that we we're looking for, yawn. So it's not really crispy. It's not really chewy, it's just all of it. That's it, folks. Looks Thank you awesome. for your time, Looks yeah? That's awesome. Thank you. Well, that looks awesome. Love that. Great recipes. And just to call Thank out, you. too, that um, so in the, in the pho, there was mung beans, the three kinds of mushrooms, the uh, winter radish, the daikon, kale, and spinach are all on the Future 50 list. And then in the salad, we had the sesame seeds, the watercress, red cabbage, jicama, sprouted chickpeas, and mung beans. So just in those two recipes alone, there's just a nice spread of, of those ingredients. Question? Yeah. I'm sorry? Can we say a little bit more about the worms? I'm curious the worms. I won't, I wouldn't put that in a vegan, yeah. That's just, that's just my saying, I can get umami, I can get MSG without the use of MSG. But again, I, I'm not talking down on MSG because, you know, I grew up on that stuff and it made me strong. <laughs> um, but it's just, you know, for me, it's, it's unnecessary. And, you know, it's just not something you, you want to show that you have in your pantry, in my belief. Any other questions for Chef Lamb? Okay, so he'll be sticking around, and we're going to pop over to Chef Bruno here, who um, will share a little bit about the inspiration for, for your dish and using some of these ingredients. So yeah, great. Um, I'm really happy to be here presenting today to, to everyone. And, you know, I was inspired. Uh, I'm inspired by, by Rob here with some of these ingredients that I haven't even really heard of um, that I'll be experimenting with, I think, soon. But... You know, my inspiration obviously uh, came to me when I was, you know, trying to, to come and present to everyone, it was obviously the 50 food report. Um, so, you know, and I think that's one of the things that you want to do. I mean, I have a whole list of key factors in how to develop a dish, and, and certainly a plant-forward dish, in my opinion, is probably one of the more difficult ones to, uh, to design, because how do you get flavor in you know, all these uh, plants. Uh, and I think there's lots of ways. We've seen some ways today, and we'll see some more. Certainly, um, I'm not totally vegan today. I'm going to use, uh, you know, another sponsored uh, item, which is the black cod. And uh, so, but I want to try and do it in a way where the vegetables and the other parts of the dish are more of the star. So, you know, I want to I wanna have a piece of protein, but I want to have you know, a smaller piece of protein and, and a larger impact on some of the vegetable and other ingredients that are in there. Um, so certainly, black cod is, is, a great, um, is a great protein because, you know, many of us probably know that um, it's sustainable. One of, the, one of the reasons it's sustainable is because it's so, uh, so much of a deep water fish. It lives, you know, closer to the bottom of the sea, and it doesn't get you know, dragged up with fishermen's nets. It's also 
um, you know, popular and you know, plentiful from a large geographical you know, area um, where it's from you know, Japan to Alaska um, to the waters right around here. So I'm using a little bit of the black cod. Um, I also think, as we talked a little bit about, you know, umami, and you know how that plays a role in especially a plant-based uh, dish. So you know, I want to bring in mushrooms, much like Rob did. Um, we have some maitake mushrooms, and you know, they're naturally high in glutamic acids. That is the main component of, of umami, but I want to even strengthen it by adding. Um, you know, some soy sauce and, and, you know, to caramelize them and to dry them out and to really focus and concentrate on, uh, on that flavor profile as it develops. Um, I'm also using oat milk, um, you know, here, which is part of the 50 Foods um, report as well, which obviously uh, is dairy-free. So um, let's get started and we'll talk more about these and see if there's any other questions. But I want to start with um, making this pancake batter, which consists of uh, chickpea flour. Now, you know, the Future 50 Foods report indicates sprouted, um, sprouted uh, chickpeas, um, which I suppose you could make sp sprouted chickpea flour, but, you know, I just have regular chickpea flour. I have a little bit of oat milk here that we're going to add, and we're just going to make a pancake batter by adding a little bit of the oat milk and a little bit of water, which is here. And then like anything, this is high in protein, so we want to kind of let it rest a little bit before we work with it. Uh, another item I'm using is nutritional yeast here. So we have a little nutritional yeast going in there, and what that offers is uh, a meaty flavor. You know, that is uh, going to offer you know, some, some meaty flavors um, and certainly some umami characteristics as well. We have a little olive oil going in there. Thank you. And then we have a little salt and black pepper. And that's it, just, just a pancake batter. I love this idea of this chickpea because I'm sure many of us have tasted this. It's got a real nutty, it's got a real earthy flavor. And uh, what I'm doing with it after that is um, obviously letting it rest. So we'll let that rest a little bit. And then we have our rested batter here. And I'm going to make a crisp with it. So I have a silicone mold. There's different kinds of molds that you might want to experiment with. But I just have a round one here. I'm going to spray it with a little food spray. Thanks. And uh, we're just going to add a little bit. To the mold and we're going to add uh, wild rice to it. Again, that's part of the 50 foods as well. So we'll add a little bit of the wild rice. So I've taken the wild rice and I've boiled it until it's tender. So we're going to sprinkle a little bit of that on. And then we're just going to bake it to set it to set it up. So that goes in a 350 degree oven for just a few minutes. As soon as it's set, um, you know, take it out, let it rest, pop them out. And then what I've done is, um, thank you, I have made them here. So, you know, I've just cut out uh, the circle to give us a little more dynamic, maybe in the presentation. So um, that's what they look like coming out. They're nice and set. And then we're going to crisp them up. And that's part of the, part of the dish. So. The next thing is uh, working off of the, um, the, uh, the mushroom mixture here. So we're going to warm up the uh, mushroom mixture. And so the mushroom mixture consists of some ingredients that are here, which we have onions that have been caramelized. And we have the, um, the mushrooms here, the maitake mushrooms that I've tossed with a little bit of soy sauce, a little bit of olive oil, a little seasoning, spread them out on a sheet pan, and then roasted them in the oven so they have a much more intense flavor. Um, we have a little garlic going in there, um, and then we have some wilted spinach, lemon zest, 
uh, chives, cilantro, and a little bit more of that nutritional yeast as well. Um, I think that adds a lot of um, flavor. It's high in B vitamins, which is you know, also something that might be important if you were creating a vegetarian dish or if you were a vegan, um, and, you know, adding more of those B vitamins into your, your dish. So we're going to add the, uh, the onions. I'm just going to warm that up. Uh, we're going to add the garlic. Maybe just a little more olive oil. So just a little bit of cooking on that garlic. I've already caramelized the onions. While that's working, um, I want to talk a little bit about the sauce. The sauce, again, um, in trying to keep more of a vegetarian, obviously it's not a vegetarian vegan dish, but you know it is um, you know, made with, uh, uh, I think, a lot of uh, ingredients that are um, healthy. We, the sauce is going to be a nut-based sauce, so that, again, nuts are part of the 50 Foods report as well. So I have some cashew nuts here, and uh, many of us may have, have done this before, is making a cream-based sauce with nuts, and I think that's what we're doing here. So I've poached them in just a little bit of water with the jalapeno to give some more you know, zest and, and interest in the sauce. So um, that's been soaking in a little bit of water. I'm going to drain that water out. We'll talk more about that when I finish the sauce. So the garlic is, is ready. We're going to add the mushrooms. We're going to add the lemon zest, nutritional yeast, little red pepper flake, and uh, we'll let that saute just briefly. So again, creating that interest, creating that craveability. Um, I think Rob really did a good job in, in having interest in the ingredients. That's one of the things I think that's important when you create a, you know, a dish, is how do you draw people in? How do you actually create that interest? And I think part of it is the unique ingredients. Part of it is you know, how it looks. Part of it is the, all, all the other parts of the ingredients, I guess, will create that craveability or uh, interest. So spinach goes in, we're just going to warm everything up at this point. Cilantro, chives. So obviously this is, I'm only doing one portion today, but I also want to talk about another product, uh, the finless tuna, which we'll, we'll get to in a little bit. Okay, so just want to warm that up, give it a little salt and pepper. All right, so that's about ready. I'll taste that in a little bit. Um, the next thing is, is working uh, the sauce. So um, I have two sauces. One is a, a chili oil that I made with uh, Korean chili flakes and olive oil and a little seasoning. Um, I've already made it. I've warmed it up, added the, the chilies, and, and allowed it to steep overnight. And that creates a nice little flavor, uh, colorful um, you know, sauce. Uh, the second one is the cashews. So I've drained the cashews. I've pureed them already in the blender, and I'm going to add cilantro as well. So that sauce consists of cilantro, lemon juice, uh, the cashew nuts, salt, pepper. So we're going to add the cilantro and quite a bit of cilantro with some of those stems, and we're going to add enough water. Uh, to puree that nice and smooth. So the cashew nuts gives us that rich, fatty, creamy characteristic without adding a lot of excess um, you know, dairy fat. And that's one of the great things I think about this is use, utilizing those nuts to give us that richness, give us that healthy part, but, but not give us all that extra dairy fat. So we might need a little bit of water, but we'll see. Actually, it's, it's going pretty good. Yeah. So we'll uh, we want to make it nice and smooth. All right. That's enough 
off noise. We'll add a little salt, a little pepper, a little lemon to give us that bright note. All right, that should be good. Get rid of this. All right, and then uh, we'll just portion that or add that to a serving dish. So it's, it's got a little brightness to it. All right, thank you. All right, so we'll save that for later. I've got some garnish of some green onions, um, and at this point, let's take out the black cod, show you that. Is it too bright? Okay. So here's the black cod. Um, it's kind of a small portion. Uh, I, I view this as sort of an appetizer or a, or a smaller entree. Um, so basically, we're just going to season it and saute it um, and, uh, and present the dish. So. While we get started with, with that, um, I want to do the crisps first. So we're just going to heat up a little olive oil and add those chickpea cakes and crisp them up. All right, so get it moderately hot. Rice side goes down first for me. And then we'll use the same pan to get the cod done as well. So while they take a minute, let's talk about this other product because I wanted to show the, the versatility with this recipe. I'm doing it with black cod today, but I also, you know, tested it with this product that's um, come out, and I think we're experiencing some of these products. Now, I'm, I'm not sure about some of the products. I've worked with um, a plant-based shrimp item, um, and I've worked a little bit with this uh, finless tuna product. Um, I think it has potential. Um, I've kind of done it pokey style, so I've added um, to this which is uh, basically um, the ingredients here is winter melon and uh, chicory root. So that's the basis. I mean, there's a bunch of other ingredients in there too, or some other ingredients. But I think largely people are, you know, looking for other ingredients that can satisfy them in a way that you know animal products uh, may may have done in the past. So I wanted to show the versatility with this um, by using the recipe with two different products, one being the spinless tuna and one being the black cod. So we'll come back to that because I think these crisps are about ready to flip. Oh, a little bit more. So if there's any questions along the way, you know, feel free. It's always nice to answer any questions that you might have, or if Allison has anything she wants to add to, to this. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the, the evolution of this concept, because you know, you know, it kind of went through, as you were developing the recipe, you went through a few different versions of it and went from starting with like a kind of a pancake concept and into the crisp, so maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, that's there. interesting because it did, it did evolve. Obviously, I wanted to use this, you know, as many ingredients as I could to make a dish with the 50 foods. Um, and, and originally, I was making a pancake with this, a thinner, and it did work. Um, but I just didn't think, you know, I don't know, it just evolved. Like uh, most of the things that we do, they evolve over time. Um, and I was going to wrap, you know, almost like cannellini, I was going to wrap the, um, uh, you know, wrap this mixture in this crepe, sort of, and then, and then you know, kind of work it with other ingredients. Um, and then I, you know, I said, well, let me try and bake it. Let me try and set it up and bake it. Um, I don't know if you have another something to put this in. 
Um, you know, and, and that worked really well. I, because one of the things I thought of is like, what if I had to do a lot of these? That, that rolling of this crepe can be obviously very time consuming. And um, I was, you know, thinking if we had to do a tasting, um, had to do a tasting on this for, you know, a lot of people, you know, that would be a, that would be a challenge. So I think this idea, you know, offers that texture. We know texture is critical in developing a dish as, as well as many other items or many things. So that, that's kind of how it came about. So we'll do the, um, the cod in the same pan. A little bit more oil, a little bit of seasoning. And then we'll just add one or two pieces and brown them up. So yeah, you know, one of the things I learned, I didn't know, you know, I mean, I love black cod. One of the things that's good about black cod, high in omega-3 fatty acids, um, you know, it's, it's loaded with, you know, healthy, um, you know, minerals, and it's sustainable. It's also, uh, you know, can live 50, you know, 90 years, I think it is. Um, you know, so that, that surprised me. I don't know if this is a 90-year-old, um, but, uh, but I was surprised at how, you know, how old they can be. Um, obviously, I, I think the younger fish, when... You know, they're, they're obviously not as in deep water right away. As they get older, they, they go deeper down in the ocean. Um, but I love this because it's really hard to overcook it. You know, if the, it, and we know fish is really tricky. It's easy to overcook. Um, and that's where, you know, a good poissonnier chef is the, is the chef that cooks the fish on the way out to the customer. I mean, that's the way I treat fish, right? Very delicate. It is uh, important to... You know, not overdo it, cook it until it's just cooked. And that can be really tricky. But with this high fat content, um, now the name of, of it is butterfish. So, you know, because of that high fat content, it gives us, you know, that, that texture, that butteriness. Not a lot of fish out there with this kind of fat content. I think that's one of the other appeals to it. Um, it's versatile. So we just want to cook it until it's opaque. Maybe warm this spinach mixture up again. All right, so that's going to finish cooking while we warm up the spinach mixture and then plate this up. So we've got two different variations or versions. Is there any of that cilantro? cilantro? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so I'm going to use a little ring mold here. Um, we're going to add some of the spinach mixture. So I want to highlight, um, you know, all the ingredients. All right, then we'll hit it with a little bit of this green sauce that has, give it a little swash here. Take that off, fish is about ready. We'll use one piece on top. And then we have a little bit of cilantro, a little bit of green onions. And then we'll top it with one of these crisps. Yeah, 
that stays, and then a little chili oil. All right, so that's, that's the black cod dish, and I think we'll see how that works. Um, and then I just kind of wanted to do uh, the same thing with um, 